Well, good morning. It's good to have you with us today uh, here at the bridge, those joining us through the live stream. Please stand as we begin our time of worship. We are here to worship the Lord, right? Is that why you're here? I'll ask that later on. Why are we here? Why do we gather? What is a church service all about? In Psalm 103, and I won't read the entire 22 verses, but I do suggest that you do sometime this week. I will just read a few. Starting with the first verse, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And then verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And then in verse 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And Father, even bless the Lord can be said in vain. Anytime we read your word or pray your word or say your word and we do it mindlessly, uh, we are misrepresenting you. Father, my desire, this worship team's desire, is that we worship you in spirit and truth. We do want that all that we think, say, and do to bring glory and honor to you, you alone are worthy of our praise. Be exalted, be extolled. Spirit of God, help us to worship you. You, true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a way that does indeed bring you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Is that truth in your heart this morning? To want to know the Lord more. Have you come to a place where you think you've learned all you can learn about God, that you know Him as well as you're ever going to know Him, that you know His Word as well as you're ever going to know it? I, I pray that... That's not where you're at. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. The late A.W. Tozer, who grew up in, what, Westover, Lajos, up that way, up the river. How's that? He said, you can have all of God that you want. You can have all of God that you want. A prayer that God will truly answer is, God, I want to know you more. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Are you diligently seeking Him? And speaking of the word reward today, I was taken back this, this week and just, I'd ask you to read, well, in fact, what two passages? If you weren't here last week, you're off the hook, okay? What, what two, two passages did I ask you to read this past week? Anybody remember? Just, all right, a couple of you do. Yeah, to read Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 17. And, I, and if you didn't do that, you, you have this week to do it. And especially watching for this matter of, of prayer, of prayer. We were singing just a little bit ago, and I'm just grateful for... For a heart that wants to praise God. That's not something I make up on my own. To have a disposition, a desire to want to truly praise God is a work of God. I was reminded of Isaiah 55 where it says this. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and hills shall break forth into singing before you. All And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That God, all of God's handiwork praises Him. And yet, of all His creation, we are the crown of His creation. We are His image bearers. And who are often the most reluctant to give him the praise and the thanks and the glory due his name. It's not the trees. It's not the stars that sing according to God's word. And scientists are now finding that out, by the way, that the stars actually make noise, they actually sing. God's word said that how many years ago, and they're finding that out. Well, my desire is for that this time, let me back up. My desire is for us to always worship God in spirit and in truth. I never want a Sunday morning to be just a time of, 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 of external holy religious practice, of just going through our normal procedures. This is how we do it. No, no, no. I want us to worship God in spirit and in truth. That's my desire. And now that we're on this topic, as we move to uh, Luke chapter 11, and we're on this topic of prayer for a little while, the last thing I want is to encourage us to recite something that is known as the Lord's Prayer of our Father, just to recite it mindlessly. How many understand that saying? As if reciting the Lord's Prayer makes us more holy. I remember years ago, 
It was over in Du Bois, I think, at Beaver Avenue, one of the streets, it doesn't matter. It was in the mid-80s. I can still remember the contractor putting up this building, this commercial building. I was working for my dad then. We were doing the HVAC. And I remember crawling around in the rafters, running duck work and stuff, and just running the Lord's Prayer through my mind. But the thing was, it was different then. It was different from the age of five, clear up till whatever, and then, and then me coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. It had drastically changed because it went from just, we recite this week after week after week to now. I'm saying this prayer because every part of it has purpose. And the sequence and the priority of this prayer, Jesus meant it for a reason. And gave it for a reason. And so the last thing I want to is encourage us to just be people go around and, and recite the Our Father, if you want to call it that, or the Lord's Prayer. Is there anything wrong with it? No. Providing that your inner person is totally engaged in saying those words. And so we're spending a little bit of time on what is known as the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. And we're going to get into the heart of what Jesus intended for his listeners then and then for anybody who reads these words in the Gospels. Let's look at Matthew's or Luke's account. We'll only read down through the first four verses. Some translations are different. I read from the New King James. So if you have like the NIV or the ESV or the New American Standard, you'll see it shortened, okay? This thing keeps blowing up here. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Father, and just in reading this, the tendency can be, because of the familiarity, and I suppose even with some, the frequency in which this, these verses are looked upon, that it, we can go through them without our mind, our affection, and our will even engaged. Father, help us to see of what Jesus intended in his instruction. Help us never to forget that he was asked, Lord, teach us to pray, and, and this was his response. This is his instructions to us. Never instructing us to just pray a set group of words without the heart and the mind engaged. Father, help us to see uh, the priority and the sequence of Jesus' instructions here. Help us to see that the purpose isn't just to be uh, adhering to a, an external religious act, but it is to commune with you, to intimately commune with you. That prayer is worship. Prayer isn't just about asking for things. Prayer is about meeting with you. Oh God, transform our praying. Move from us from just saying short, flippant little 
request to you to longing to commune with you continually. I thank you and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but there's times when I fall before the Lord, kneel down, whatever, and can't even get my mind settled. The mind is just a myriad of things running through it. Uh, you know, a plethora of, of thoughts just boom. Uh, Oswald Chambers calls it a mental wool gathering to where you're just trying to get settled so that, okay, I can, I can talk now, God. I, I got some things in order here. How many understand that? And if you're not going to your secret place, and that secret place, by the way, it may be your living room, it may be your car on your way to school or work. In fact, do me a favor and, and hold your place in Luke 11. <laughs> Luke 11 always just, Luke 11 almost sounds like I want to throw out ukulele. It just, I'm sorry, it just, it's, a, it's another one of those things up here in this, in this brain of mine that I'm afraid is going to slip out. That's a stretch. In, in your bulletins, in your bulletins, I, I have a couple more verses added to passages to ponder and apply. And some of you stellar students here today will say, well, you had two of those in last week's bulletin, and you're right, I did. But they're that good, and I think they should be there again in helping you learn. But also I have verses 5 and 6 added. Now, so Matthew chapter 6, 5 and 6. And by the way, remember, this is Jesus instructing his followers. Uh, there is the, the, the disciples, and then there's multitudes that have gathered around and known as the Sermon on the Mount, and he's instructing them. And one of the things he's instructing them, if you look at verse 1, take heed there that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. What is he doing? And in his instructing, he's saying, look, I don't want your thoughts, your words, or your actions to ever be done in a hypocritical way. And then when you seek my face, you're seeking your heavenly Father. And your heavenly Father, Father honors those who honor him. So when you do your charitable deeds, I don't want you to be like hypocrites. I don't want you to be like that. You do it, not sounding the horn, not boasting. Do you ever get one, handed one of those things? Here, put your name on it. Do you want to donate a dollar to such and such? Here, put your name on it. I put Matthew 6, 3 is what I put on it. Done it different times. Here, post this on your window if you insist on having something there. Now, I, I'm, I'm not saying you have to practice that. I'm, I, you know, I'm just, why? Because we're not to do things for recognition from men. That's hypocritical. You might be thinking, well, Scott, we're talking about prayer today, aren't we? Yes. But I want you to see, and here's the thing. And talk about a plethora of things running through my head and a, and a myriad of things in this mind of mine. Do I have points for today? Yes, I, I do, and I plan to share a few of those. For those of you that need to leave early, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But if you ask the average person, what is the context of the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer? Do you think many could tell you what comes before and what follows? How many would know that it comes from the Sermon on the Mount? And so this is why I'm giving you a little background. Because prior to the instruction of how we're to pray, it is instruction of how you and I are to live and to conduct ourselves. And that there is reward in doing so. And not that we do it for that reward. We do it because we love God and we, we want to honor Him in all that we do. And, and so I'll, I'll just let that at that. Verse 3, don't let your, when you do your charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. 
Just, just do it in secret. Keep a low profile. God will, will reward you. And again, not that we do it for reward. We do it because we want to honor God in all that we do. So when then we come to verse 5, and verse 5 and 6 are in your bulletin. And when you pray, and it's not even a matter if you pray, because Jesus knows that his followers are going to want to commune with the Father. This is why I wanted you to read chapter 6. Because I wanted you to see the context of the Lord's Prayer. I also wanted you to see the intimacy that is here for us. That intimacy between us and the Father. And Jesus giving that instruction. That prayer is about communing with God. That's what it's about. So verse 5, and when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. Now some will take this out of context and say, there, you're not to pray in public. That is not what it is saying. It's saying, when you pray, you're not to stand up and make a production out of it so that people are saying, well... And so that you're feeling, listen to me, listen to me. There's people, and you probably have experienced this, that you never ask if you're at the family gathering, family meal, you don't ask so-and-so to ask the blessing over the meal. At least if you're hungry, you don't ask them. And, and I've probably been one that's been asked that I will never ask him again. But I've learned, and a, a good brother, friend of mine, pastor friend of mine, says, you know, asking a blessing at a gathering is not a time for your devotion. It's just... And so often he'll, he'll say, I'll pray. <laughs> Short and sweet, because I'm hungry. We, we can even turn a blessing into a production, right? It's not the amount of words that we say. It's, it's what we're saying. Where it's coming from. The intention of our words. That's what's important. And so Jesus says, and when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. Okay, so I already said that. And Jesus said they have their rewards. But look at verse 6. It's in your bulletin if you're not open to Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, because he's assuming we're going to pray as his children, children of, of our Heavenly Father, we're going to pray. I don't know about you, but I can't help but to pray. I told, I've said this before. I don't know if I said it here. I know I've said it at faith, and this isn't, this is truth. In fact, everything I tell you, I strive to be truthful. I don't think I even need to quantify, or to qualify things by saying, can I be honest with you? I talk to God more than I talk to anybody. I just do. Scott, do you mean verbalized? Do you mean words actually coming out of your mouth? No, not necessarily, but I think probably still I talk to him more even that way than I do anybody. Definitely mentally, just having dialogue? Yes. And I believe Jesus was absolutely that way. That there, there wasn't a time while he walked the face of this earth that he wasn't communing with the Father. Now, you and I, if we've been born of the Spirit, the Spirit of God brings new life. The Spirit of God indwells us, seals us under the day of redemption. And we have fellowship with God. We have communion with God. Even when we're not conscious or conscious of that, we're still in communion with him. He still dwells within. But Jesus is talking about this time when you, when you go into your place, into that secret place, whatever it may be, and, and we pray. And who do we pray to? We pray to our Father. This isn't just a religious exercise. This is communing with God. That's the purpose of a prayer, of worshiping Him through prayer. And I hope that you see that. And he says that the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And some translations don't drop the word openly. In other words, spending time with God in solitude, 
in communion with him, praising him, thanking him, crying out your heart to him. It's never in vain. When my wife and I were saved many, many, many years ago, and we would go out to Denison, Ohio, out to this uh, youth camp. And I remember hearing this little chorus. Now if I can remember it. <laughs> to walk with God, no strength is lost. Walk on. To talk with God, no breath is lost. Talk on. To wait on God, no time is lost. Wait on. So walk and talk and wait on God. Have you ever gotten up from, from communing with him? Okay, I do have things to do today, so God, we're going to pick this up and we're going to move it now. And we're just going to keep going. Hey, have you ever gotten up? Boy, that was a waste of my time. But if you don't do that, then you wouldn't know. God calls us to commune with Him. He calls us to commune with Him in, in secret and, and, and in step, as I've told you before. Well, I wanted you to read Matthew 6. I wanted you to look at that. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, 17 times Jesus refers to the Father. And so when you think of what is known as the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, the very first line, Our Father. I wonder how many people say those two words and there's no connection. That God is just a distant deity. He's aloof. When you say our Father, or when you say Heavenly Father, or my Father, again, let me go back 35 plus years ago when my wife and I were saved. And I used to love just sitting on Wednesday nights and hearing those dear people just calling them, calling God Father, but the, the words that would precede that, kind Heavenly Father, gracious Father. How many understand? Cold, distant, calloused. Sovereign. No, no. Never heard those words. Why? Because those people knew God, I believe. And it's like we just can't add enough words to de describe it. And so Jesus directs his children, Jesus directs his followers to pray to our Father. Six times in Matthew chapter 6. Or I'm sorry, 12 times in Matthew chapter 6. Your father. Father, 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 father. When you're talking to God, when you're communing with God, when you're praying, how often does the word father in regards to our heavenly father, how many times does it come out of your mouth in a day? Does it? The closest relationship you and I are to have as children of God is our relationship with our father. Through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's a glorious communion. It's glorious. From the time I awake to the time I close my eyes. And I'm going to tell you, there's times when the conversation isn't good. When I'm being chastened and I have to repent of, of thoughts, of words, of actions. But even then, he's loving and he's gracious. That's why I want you to read Psalm 103 this week. Now, for some of you, now you have three chapters to read. Matthew 6, John 17, Psalm 103. We're getting nowhere today in way of slides. That's okay. I believe we will uh, do just well here. John chapter 17 was another passage I asked you to read. Why? Well, there again, Jesus is praying to the Father, and six times he uses the Father. Not only that, because what I want to know is, is prayer something for you? Is your prayer life, should you have one, and you should as a follower of Christ, in fact, it ought to just, our, our lives just merge into this life of prayer. 
It is to be personal. It is to be intimate. The Lord's Prayer really could be called the Disciples' Prayer. It is a model prayer. It's a prayer of instruction. And again, yes, it can be prayed word for word. But it was never intended to just be recited again mindlessly. But in John 17, not only do we find the word Father six times, you. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says you 37 times. And maybe you're not a number of, or a person of numbers and statistics, and I'm really not. My point is simply this. What is at the heart of Jesus' prayer in John 17? The Father. That, 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 that close, intimate relationship. He wants the Father to be glorified. He wants his life to glorify the Father. He talks about the world 19 times. And how he has called his followers out of the world. And how he doesn't pray for the world. He prays about unity. That we all may be one. You see, prayer is a matter of worshiping God. Prayer is a matter of communing with God. Prayer is not some, some religious activity. Well, he's our father. First slide, please. Boy, it's not looking good for you guys who want to get out of here early. We're on our first slide. <clears throat> This is a little bit of a reminder who our Father is. Remember last week, again, those who weren't here, exempt. Isn't God everybody's Father? And the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Now, Isaiah 64, 8, but now, O Lord, you are... You are our father, we are the clay, and you are, you're, you're our potter. And we are the work of your hand. That's everybody. Everybody in the sense of this, that he is the creator of all mankind. That mankind is created in the image and the likeness of God. And that he is parent and he is provider, and he is protector of all. But he is not everyone's spiritual father. Because until you're born of the Spirit, you don't know him as the Heavenly Father. And you need to understand that. Now in this verse, and Israel the only real true theocracy... In this verse, we're seeing that, that, that Isaiah is praying and he's representing Israel. And he says, but now, Lord, you are our father. You are our father. He's reckoning that as a nation. We're yours. We're yours. And yet, not all of Israel knew the father, knows the father as their heavenly father. So. Let's look at the next one, just quickly in review. These are all review. For you are the sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There's a distinction. Isn't God everybody's father? Yes, his way of creator. But he's only the father of those who have been adopted into his family. Next verse. And because you are sons... God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Last week we also had Romans 8, verses 14 and 15, where it talks about, for as many are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. It talks about those who re- those are the ones who receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Okay. So who is Jesus instructing here to pray, Our Father? Those who know God as their Father. How do we get to know God as our Father? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Next one, real quickly. Review. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's, there's no getting around. We'll sneak past you, Jesus, to the Father. No, you won't. And so the question you need to be asking yourself, hmm, do I see the Father that way? Or I guess do I just see him as, yeah, he's the one who created us all, so he's, he's everybody's father. But I, I never noticed or made that distinction. But wait a minute. Not everybody's been adopted into his family because not everybody has come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And again, another passage, we talked about Jesus being our only mediator. For there's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. We talked about that. And so, we're now, all that set aside, Jesus is instructing his followers, true children of God, to pray. And how are we to pray? Well, we're to pray to our Father where? In heaven. Next slide, please. And so, Psalm 103, verse 19. Did I mention about reading Psalm 103 this week? Okay, good. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Where's heaven? That's a good question. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 12 of being in the third heaven. So we have the atmosphere, that's heaven. We have the universe, the universe, the galaxies, all that's there. That's the second heaven, if you will. And then we have God's abode, somewhere beyond the blue. And all these billionaires, they can build their spaceships and stuff, but I'm going to tell you, they're never going to get to God that way. It's not going to happen. How do they get to God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And they're not going to live forever either. They will live forever if they know Jesus because we pass from death on to life. Well, next verse. This is David praying. David would not build the, the temple for various reasons mentioned in Scripture, but his son Solomon would. And David did a a lot in preparing for that. And here we find David praying, King David praying. And he's praying to the Father in heaven. He's praying to God. And he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is what, church? It's yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. I hope you're starting to see a, a, a very remarkable thing here. And that is the vastness of God and yet the intimacy of God. That the one who spoke all things into existence holds all things together by the word of by the power of his word is also the God who meets with you and I in the secret and in step. Ponder these, this verse a little bit. David's acknowledging his greatness. Time spent on those hillsides of Bethlehem watching those sheep and just looking at the stars. In fact, it reminds me of, uh, of Psalm 8. And I love that passage where it says, O Lord, o our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. David pondered that often. But David, a man after God's own heart. David, a perfect man, not by far. But a man who acknowledged his heavenly father. His greatness, his vastness, his sovereignty. The next thing we see in the prayer, when you think about it, and, it, and you can be there at Matthew 6, starting with verse 9, or you can go back to Luke 11, which is where we're where we're at and will be for a little bit. <clears throat> any rate, the next thing that we see after our Father in heaven 
How, how many, you don't need to show your hands, but well, I never knew there was so much in that thing that we just rattle off. He, he, Jesus never wanted it rattled off. There's times because of schedule. This is what I pray. It's concise, and yes, it's all-encompassing. And the priority is there. You see, it's worship. Jesus is directing us to worship the Father. Our Father. In heaven. And then that line, hallowed be your name. Now, I bet you scores of years ago, you ask the average person on the street, what does that even mean? They would have an idea. But today, if you ask that question, they'd look at you like you had a third eye. What are you talking about? Because there's very little reverence. There's even very little consideration for God, for the Father, and for His name. What does hallowed be your name mean? It means that his name is to be honored. It means that his name is holy. Here, here's a verse that I think is very helpful in getting it and where my mind ran to when I was praying about this. And this, here is Isaiah. And he says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is what, church? Oh, come on. I dwell, this is what blows my mind. You won't need a lot of dynamite for that. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I don't know if you realize, uh, just in reading that once, the richness and the fullness that is here in this verse. Because here you see uh, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Here we see, yes, the highness, the loftiness, the holiness, the supremacy of God. And yet, look what he does. He's the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is what? Holy. Hallowed be thy name. One of the prayers I often pray is God, please, and I plead with them, please never let me bring shame to your name. Never let me bring pain to your family and to your kingdom. Because man's heart, as Jeremiah says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the things that play or that run through any person's mind, the thoughts are, can be so horrid. Can you imagine anything worse other than hell itself? I don't think there could be anything worse than putting a HDMI cable right here and play it on the big screen, over the internet, Facebook, whatever, for everybody to see. How many is understanding that? There wouldn't be a rock close enough or big enough to want to get under quick. Right? And if you sit there, no, I never think like that. Okay. We don't honor the name of God as we should. OMG? Really? The big man upstairs? Really? Do you know that the third commandment is we're not to use the Lord's God's name in vain? 
And that's more than just using it as a curse word, but that's just looking at it in any way that any way other than his name is to be used as, and that is held in the highest regard and honored. To make oaths in his name and not to follow through. To be flippant about it. How important is God's name to you? Because Jesus said, when you pray, pray to your Father in heaven. You're not praying to some mortal man. You're not praying to some prophet who supposedly was from God and yet his tomb is, in, is still there today. No, no. You're praying to the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. The name holy means rendered. It means to be rendered and pronounced. Or the, yeah. Holy, his name is to be celebrated. It's to be esteemed. It's to be proclaimed. And look at what he does, this high and holy one, this transcendent one, the true and living God. Look at what he does. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit. What is this saying? It means the only way of coming to God is in the way of humility. I don't have time, and here's another passage you can read. At least read the first eight verses of Isaiah 6. And I do need to wrap this up for those people who have to get going, I guess. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, he, he sees the vision of God. And he hears the, he hears the, the seraphim and, and, and the praise, as we sang earlier, holy, holy holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah is just taken back by this. But then the next thing that, that transpired after he saw the holiness of God was just how sinful he and his people were. And he cried out, I'm a man of unclean lips. But what does God do for him? So the seraphim takes a coal off the altar and he touches it on his mouth and he cleanses his lip and now he's made clean. And so now he's in a place, he's in a place of humility, he's in a place where he can commune with God. Some are so proud they wouldn't even think to look to God. What do I need God for? about forgiveness how about so that you can spend eternity with him instead of separated with him to spend eternity in heaven instead of spending eternity in hell do you realize just the transcendent one willing to condescend, willing to stoop down to have fellowship with you and I, that's what blows this mind of mine. That this one who is so vast is also so personal. You say, well, you're getting a lot out of this Our Father, aren't you? That's what Jesus is saying, though. That's what he's saying. When you pray, I want you to commune with your Father in heaven. The one whose, whose kingdom is above all things, who rules and reigns, and yet wants to come down and commune with you. That's what prayer is. I can't believe it, but we don't have time for more. And so, let's stand. And no, it's not because they have to go. Caden, put 1 John 3, 1, and we'll close with this consideration. Thank you. Here's what I want you to think about. You, you've, you've gotten an you've gotten earful today, and I know that God's Word does not return void. 
And you have a lot to think about. You really do. Or, or not. You might just settle in. Nope, I'm used to it just being recited. And that's what the Lord's Prayer is all about. And, and I'm quite satisfied with that. And I'll be praying against that. Because God wants us to come to Him. As His children. Recognizing His holiness. His goodness. His love. His mercy. He wants to commune with you and I. And so John said this, where he said, Behold, what manner of love? That high and lofty one, whose name is holy, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on upon us that we should be called what, church? The children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Jesus praying several times in the Lord's or in, in, in John 17, the world doesn't know. The world doesn't know. I don't want you to be part of the world that doesn't know him. I want you to be part of the people who know him, who have been born of the Spirit and are children of God, who cries out, Our Father in heaven, hallow and holy be your name. And I want your kingdom to come. I'm experiencing your kingdom. The kingdom of God is within right now. I want to experience that, and I want others to experience your kingdom. That's the heart of the child of God. Father in heaven. And I don't say those words flippantly, and I'm thankful that I can say those words in a heart that's been, that has been made new and transformed. Move us, Father, from empty, mindless prayers to communion with you for your glory, for your honor, and all through by the faith that we have in Christ, our only mediator, our only savior, our only way to you, in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen.
Father, as we consider those words that we just got done singing, I pray they too would be from the heart that all we say and all we do, that we would honor you, we'd honor your name, that name that is above every name, that name in which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory, O Father. And Father, I pray that you would start running the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. Start running it through our minds and that we could use each petition that is there as a starting point, prayer points, to just say the words, Our Father, and then just to let your spirit and your word direct us to expound upon you being our Father. To pray about your kingdom, your name, our Father in heaven, that that's your abode. The day, and someday we will go to be with you in that new Jerusalem, that new heaven. And that your name is to be hallowed, it's to be honored. And to pray that your kingdom would be experienced by us, your kingdom would come and your will to be done, and so on. That we would look at those each of those petitions and say, Jesus, teach me how to pray. These words, these instructions you gave, these priorities and praying that you have given, help us to look at them line by line and help us to commune with you through them and to live your will. All for your glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.